Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger, and we are in the book of Ezra. So, do I have to have a, bur- a building permit? Well, that depends on uh, what you're building, where you're building it, and um, what the use um, regulations in your particular district say. Okay. What if I'm a Hebrew, um, I've just come out of Babylon, and I'm rebuilding the temple in the city of Jerusalem in the uh, 4th century BC? Well, your um, the track record of your city is questionable. We've raffled through our files, and it seems that uh, your city's caused a lot of trouble in the past. That so, seems like racial profiling, just saying. What is this strange thing you were talking about? We are treating a conquered province the way we treat all conquered provinces, with blunt violence. <laughs> anyway, so this is kind of the situation that uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua found themselves in. They've been told to, and given permission by the Persian government to rebuild the temple. And along with that, the city, but the the, the temple got priority and gets, actually gets m- mentioned in more uh, permit forms than anything else. And so when they started building the temple, they started building the city and adversaries showed up. And after first pretending to be friends, these Samaritan peoples turned on them. And said in so many words, where are your building permits? Who's doing the building? What are their names? We need to check with the relevant authorities back in Persia and find out if this is really legitimate. And so they send letters. We have a record of a few of them. This really indicates that their their offer of help before was very not genuine. <laughs> very, very not genuine. No. Like if there were any doubt at that point, we see now. <laughs> oh, you're not going to let us help. Well, we're going to shut you down. Well, maybe they just got their feelings hurt, and if they had been treated with more respect, they would not be enemies. You know, kind of like the Soviet Union, the United States. Well, it seems like when what you care about most is the worship of God. Your feelings come pretty low on the list. <laughs> you think, wouldn't you? Uh, strangely, no. Um, no? <laughs> no. Uh, a lot of people who care about the worship of God define the worship of God in terms of their feelings. Hmm. Zerubbabel and Joshua have a clear mandate from the Lord to be about this business. And the city was included both in prophecy and in more broadly in Cyrus's instructions, but time has passed. Cyrus has been away. The project took took a while to get off its feet and get going. And the people's labors were divided between building the temple and building their own homes. And all of that together gave Cyrus time to, well, die, his son to die even faster, the uh, uh, an imposter to try to seize the throne, and then he died even faster. And the empire now fell into the lap of one Darius, or Darius, depending how you want to pronounce it, uh, one of the great generals. And so right now, Darius is busy stabilizing uh, his new empire. When he gets a message from the Samaritans saying, there are these people here who are trying to build this city, and we think it's a bad deal, we think it's bad for you, it's bad for the empire. Don't exactly mention would be bad for us economically too. Besides the fact of um, ethnic uh, rivalry going on here, so uh, why don't you look and see? Check your history, check your records, and you'll find that this city is not a city you really want rebuilt. It's a, the King James even has them saying the city. It's a bad city. <laughs> it's guilty of of uh, rebellion and insurrection, and it's just altogether. A bad place. So you probably want to do something about this. The emperor has enough guys who work for him that he's able to task it to someone who does the record keeping and looks through things and finds out, oh, Jerusalem, yeah, we got records on that city. Yes, it has a tradition of insurrection, rebellion against whoever's in charge of it at any given time, whether it be Assyria or Babylon or whatever. So the word comes back from the king yeah, no. Let's tell them to stop right now. 
But then he adds significantly, until you hear word from me otherwise. <laughs> he had learned something from his namesake, a previous Darius, who had thrown Daniel in the lion's den, who was probably himself Cyrus. He gave that, that Darius, that Cyrus, got in trouble for not leaving loopholes. You, know, mm -hmm. you have to do this or else lion's den, and there was no way out. This emperor says... I'm leaving loopholes because some new information may present itself. But for the moment, yeah, shut them down. And so the, the Samaritans show up with force and say, you're not going to build anymore. Now, what they told them was, and what the decree from the emperor said was, you're not going to build your city. You're going to stop building the walls and the gates and all of that. It did not say anything about the temple, because the question hadn't really been raised. Hmm. Unfortunately, God's people looked at the whole situation and said, well, this just stinks. Where are the promise of God? Where's God's sovereign intervention? Where are the miracles? Why isn't this going our way? We thought that this would just be a cinch. We got it started, but it's, well, it obviously is not the time. It's, if God's in control, then it's not his time. It's not his season. It's not his way. Let's go concentrate not on the walls, which we're forbidden to do, but Maybe on our own homes. Oh, we need wood. Well, you know, I saw a lot of wood laying out by the temple site. No one's using it now. Yeah. And this is where <clears throat> we run into the prophet Haggai. Actually, Haggai and Zechariah both begin prophesying about this time. And Haggai says to these people uh, in chapter 1, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, It's a time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, and but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to be put into a bag with holes. Hole in your pocket. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up into the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of my house, it's waste. And you run every man into his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon the men, and upon the cattle, and upon all the labor of their hands. And then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Shosedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, <gasps> obeyed the voice of the Lord their God in the words mm -hmm. of Haggai the prophet. And they start getting back to work. Now, that's a cute, sweet little story, and it's easy to reduce it to that. Oh, that's a cute little story. This is a crucial moment in redemptive history. God had promised the temple and the city would be rebuilt, that worship would be conducted there, and that God would reveal his presence in this restoration temple in more glorious ways than he ever had done. He can't just stop here. But also the hearts of the people are very distracted by worldliness. Well, yeah, this seemed like a great, exciting thing to do for God, but the government said no. So let's go do something that's more comfortable for us. Let's not only spend our monies and energies on our homes, but this money that we had dedicated to God, that's the stuff, in fact, that Cyrus himself had provided, uh, we're not going to be using it on the temple. Let's use it for our homes. And so God says, and that's why your crops aren't growing and the rains aren't coming and nothing's going right for you because you screwed up your priorities. That wasn't the kind of miracle they wanted. No, that was not at all the kind of miracle or special providence or even ordinary providence they wanted. They wanted to God to do something really extraordinary that would relieve them from a whole lot of effort and any kind of difficulties or uncomfortableness. But God has basically the command, get to work. 
because this you're not forbidden to do. The government has not told you not that you can't do this. So, and I've told you you should. So go do it. Now, the story doesn't end there. Yes, they get back to work, but the Samaritans are ever vigilant. <laughs> and they see, oh, you're building this temple thing. Well, they understood, as not everyone does these days, that religion is a, mi a major financial center of operations and influence. If you have a place that draws hundreds and thousands and more from from your immediate area and from far off, and they're coming there, you know what? They're going to need places to stay. They're going to need to buy food. They're going to have their horses shod. They're going to buy souvenirs and trinkets. They're going to, in this case, with the temple, they're going to buy animals for sacrifices. There, this a lot. This is going to draw a lot of money to this particular place. So the Samaritans are still not happy because they see this not merely as religious rivalry, although it was that. They had their own version of Yahweh worship, they thought. But it was also, again, another financial economic challenge. So, writing letters worked really well last time. Let's write some more letters. Uh, they go back and they confront the Jews and say, what, what's this all about? And they say, well, we are building the temple that um, Cyrus, king of Persia, told us we could. And the, Sam the Samaritans try to kick up a fuss, but it's not going anywhere because these people are standing pat and saying, no, we have, we have an order. Well, the Samaritans don't believe it. Or at least they're hoping this is a bluff, or they're hoping that something's been lost to the paperwork that they can use here. So they write um, another letter to, Do to Darius. And it goes something like this. Unto Darius the king, all peace. Be it known unto the king that we went to the province of Judea, to the house of the great God, they're respectful, which is builded with great stones and timber, is laid in the walls, and the work goeth fast on and prospereth in their hands. Then ask we those elders, and said unto them, Who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? We asked their names also, to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were chief of them. And thus they returned answer, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and build the house which was builded these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. But after our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave the land into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried the people away to Babylon. And in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, because he conquered Babylon, the same year Cyrus made a decree uh, to build this house of God. And the vessels also of gold and silver in the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem, brought them into the temple of Babylon. These those that Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon, they were delivered unto one whose name was um, Sheshbazzar, whom he made governor, and said, basically, take these back and do this. So the bottom line of the letter, now, therefore, if it seemed good to the king, let there be search made in the king's treasure house, which is at Babylon, whether this is so, whether there was such a decree from Cyrus to build this house, and then have let the king tell us what we should do. So they're they're being polite and respectful, the great temple of the great God. And again, our concern is that they have permission to do this. So it's quite a story. Would you mind checking it out and seeing if it's actually accurate and if they do, in fact, have the proper permit? Did this Cyrus, who's, you know, four kings back now, did he actually authorize this? Well... In chapter 6 of Ezra, we're told that Darius the king made a decree and search was made in the house of the rolls where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found at Akmetha, in the palace, which is the province of the Medes, a roll um, that therein was written. So they looked in Babylon and they didn't find anything. But unlike many bureaucrats, they did not stop there. They said, well, <laughs> where else could it be? And it, well, Darius or Cyrus was a Persian. How about the Persian capital? The, the King James uh, calls it here Akmetha. Archaeology knows it as Ekbana. Let's see if I can pronounce it right. Ekbatana. There we go. Ekbatana. Uh, well known in archaeological circles and Persian history books. 
And lo and behold, they found it. It's not exactly the one that's recorded in the scripture. It's another version, probably for ministerial purposes. But it said what they needed it to say. And rise in the light of this as well. Uh, this being so, and here's here's his take. Let the work of the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree what you shall do to the elders of the Jews for building this house. Oh, here it is. He's going to get us. He's going to let us do something to them. Yeah, take out of your treasuries and give them money for the house <laughs> and for the sacrifices and for the salt, so that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and of his sons. Also, I make a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let the timber be pulled down from his house and being set up, let him be hanged thereon and let his house be made a dunghill for this. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. <laughs> Seems like they might have rediscovered the story of Esther there, <laughs> and been <laughs> inspired by some elements of that history. Well, that or perhaps this, it is likely, in fact, that this Darius is the Ahasuerus of Esther. The question would be timing. Mm. But but uh, yeah, putting someone uh, on, hanging someone on making their house a dunghill. Yeah, sounds like the yeah, same king, doesn't it? Like the rich dramatic <laughs> irony yes. of, and the the wily coyote yeah. <laughs> of it all. Yes, there there is a certain wiliness in this whole thing because these people are trying to stop God's work, and in the end, they all they manage to do is acquire federal funding for it <laughs> uh, with no strings, uh, with the best of intentions. They basically say. Everyone keep their hands off. This is the God of mm -hmm. heaven. We're not going to dictate to him or his guys what they have to do. All they're doing, they're doing this religious thing. We approve. In fact, they, we want them to do it for us. We want them- And you have to pay their legal fees since and you, you Yeah, you have to pay their legal <laughs> fees and, and their material fees to keep this thing running. It's coming out of your taxes. So I'm glad, I'm sure you'll be happy with that, knowing it's the God of heaven and you spoke so highly of it in the beginning. Uh and th th there's a little more, but that's that's basically the story. And out of this, there are there are some things that we can we can talk about. I have six lessons, six points, six whatever <laughs> that we can consider. And feel free to um, build on my suggestions. The first thing is the, the people of God got themselves into trouble because or when they had an opportunity to pursue the worship of God. And remember, worship always means the gospel. Mm -hmm. We worship through the gospel, and the and worship presents to us the gospel. Their worship started with building up the altar with its sacrifices, which is a testimony to substitutionary atonement, justification by faith, and everything else that was going on there, all of the 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 temple structure that would make room for the various feasts and the Day of Atonement fast and all the rest was all designed to preach the gospel to those who came there or to those who heard about it. This was the major thing. It had been destroyed. It had been destroyed apparently by pagans. And you may remember that in the prophets and all the way back to Solomon when he first built the temple and dedicated it, said, you know, when this thing goes down, when this thing is destroyed and lies desolate, people are going to say, what happened here? And you are to tell them. This is because they sinned against the God of heaven, against the God who redeemed them, and that's why he destroyed it. This is not that God lost control. This is not that God failed. This is his people turned to unbelief and rebellion, and they got what they deserved, and you can see it in the ruins. Mm -hmm. So this rebuilding the temple was the, the major focus and center of evangelism for the Jewish people at this point. God did not send them out into the four corners of the earth, as he later will his church. He planted them at the crossroad of three continents. Yes, it was going to be a financial center that would draw people. They would come and they would see the temple. They would be drawn into the court of the Gentiles. They would hear the reading of God's word. They would be told about the ritual. They'd hear about the great acts that Yahweh had done for his people in the past. And they would thus hear the gospel. So this is major. This is not as simple as well, we want to build a big church. You can carry on a gospel ministry without a big church building or a lot of programs 
or light and sound or, you know, go down the list. But you can't carry on church without the gospel. Mm -hmm. And this is a presentation of the gospel. And God's people thought, yeah, that's not that important. What's important is that I have a nice house. This is my cat sitting on my lap. (laughs) I really don't want you. Hi, Lucy. (laughs) Um, You go away. Okay, thank you. (laughs) So, lesson. God is not particularly concerned about, as Schaefer would say, our personal peace and affluence. He's concerned about his gospel. Mm -hmm. And he may call us to spend our time and energy and monies on things that deprive us of comfort, convenience, luxury, so that that gospel can be promoted and presented to a sinful world. He does not require that all the time. Oftentimes, he lets us do both, have an effective Mm -hmm. gospel ministry and have air conditioning in our houses. (laughs) But sometimes it does not work that way. And when it comes to making a choice, the Jews had to learn a lesson. This is a real choice. And the gospel ministry has to come before our personal comforts. This is a huge lesson that we as Americans have trouble with. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow him. Uh, Self-denial. Death to self. Death to conveniences and pleasures and luxuries. Death to things we think we have to have because everybody else has them. But sometimes that money could have been spent reaching a new people with the gospel or promoting a struggling ministry and refueling it with gospel ammunition or funding and creating gospel ammunition Mm -hmm. by the Bible translated into different languages, Bible studies and books translated into different languages, printed, shipped across sea. You know, there's a lot that money can do. And sometimes we have to make choices. And as I said, God doesn't insist that we spend every single dollar uh, all the time on gospel ministry, but sometimes it needs to be a lot higher priority than we sometimes make it. Mm-hmm. Two. And if you're looking for a percentage, <laughs> there's yeah, a continuum. If you're looking for a percentage, you can start with God's, which is 10% of your um, net. You know, the, some of the common objections to that percentage is, Uh, Well, we shouldn't be legalistic. We should just give joyfully to God out of our hearts as the Spirit leads us. Okay. That doesn't tell us how much. (laughs) Yeah. If you're objecting to legalism and you want to give joyfully and thankfully, don't you think that 10% would mark a bare minimum then? Why is it we suddenly drop down to 1%? If that, sometimes. Uh, yeah, God God told us 10%. That's just the tithe. He demands offerings on top of that. Mm-hmm. Malachi rebukes the people because they brought God in tithes and in offerings. Well, how much does an offering have to be? Well, that's where your joy and thankfulness gets to kick in and the Spirit's leading <laughs> can do what it will once you've paid your 10%. So that's the, the 10% is, is just a lesson to teach us, oh, it's all God's, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And if we have a problem with the 10%, then we've got a problem with the whole picture of what giving is. Mm-hmm. Two, we must not let our desire for comfort rewrite our hermeneutics and our eschatology. Mm-hmm. Um, you mean God wants us to fund a major missionary program to reach a dark corner of the world, and it's going to cost X amount of money, plus we're going to have to train missionaries, they're going to have to learn the language. They're going to have to go with their families very far away. We're going to have to support them the whole time they're there because there's nothing there. And um, we're going to, once they planted a church, we're going to have to keep supporting it. And this is going to require logistics and publications and communications and note keeping and, you know, go down the list. This is a major thing. This sounds really hard. It really seems like, you know, there there just aren't open doors for that yeah, right now. Yeah, I mean, sure. Don't open doors. Just kind of, you know, some guy walks in full of the Spirit of God and everybody gets converted. <laughs> so this, this seems a little hard, um, which no doubt means that this isn't really what God wants right now. We're a small denomination. We don't have this kind of funding. We don't have this or vision either. Um, and so, yeah, the, our, our, our view of the future really says that before Jesus comes back, the church is going to keep shrinking and shrinking. 
So it's nice that you care about these people and want to see souls saved. And, um, you know, if you can find somebody who wants to go there, that's great. But we think we should spend more money right now um, on updating the Trinity hymnal, say. Mm -hmm. uh, buying a piano that's not quite as tinny. Uh, updating the sound system. Putting our uh, pastor's messages online so that people can stay home and watch them. What what's happening here? And these, these I like to say these are exaggerations. Unfortunately, they really aren't. When we don't have God's vision for the worldwide spread, powerful, effective spread of the gospel, when we don't believe the gospel is that He's going to bless all nations, then we are content not to do an awful lot of things. There was a uh, radio pastor in the. 50s and 60s, who had a favorite line, you don't polish brass on a sinking ship. Well, that's true, but that now presupposes that your ship is sinking. Mm -hmm. um, if Western culture, if that's all it is, and there's nothing beyond, and we're on a time limit, and within X number of hours, weeks, or months, Jesus is coming back, then there's a lot of things we really don't have to worry about. We don't have time for. We don't have time to tear down the old rebuke the wicked, or raise up something new and good. We just say, well, that's what our prophecy said would happen. We said the church would shrink, and look, it's happening. We said <laughs> wickedness would grow. Wow, we were so right. Um, I think uh, you know, people of my age are probably looking around right now and saying, well, we said it was bad. It's going to get bad, but we thought this would all happen after the rapture. This, this culture is very, very wicked. Where's Jesus? He was supposed to come, you know, back in 1988 or 1980 or 2000 or someplace. Um, no doubt he's coming any minute now because that's what our eschatology says, because the opposite would be to say we have to do something. God's actually got a plan for us and for his gospel. So there, there comes a point where you can look at how difficult ministry is, and you can and you can take that as a message from God to give it all up, as you say, well, that door's closed. Or you can look at the promises of God as they appear in Scripture and say, God has a glorious future for his church. He did not promise it would be easy. So it looks like it's not going to be. Let's go do it. <laughs> Three, God rules in the created order and in the government of men. And his action in both spheres are covenantal. Uh, it is not that if we obey God X amount and pull the lever, we will get Y blessings in a particular mm -hmm. measure. We know that. Mm -hmm. But it is also true that in general, when we seek God in faith and do what he has plainly told us to do, somewhere in there, he probably is going to reward what we're doing with the kind of successes that please him. They may not be the kind of successes we had in mind. We may think we're ministering to Group A, and suddenly something leaks through to Group B, and they get it all on fire, and we're saying, wait, but we didn't plan to work with them. Well, that's the door God just opened. That's how God's blessing you. Okay, I guess. You know, you, you start to, some kind of missions drive or evangelistic drive in your community, and you expect all the wealthy people to come and all the homeless people come. That's blessing. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for it? Um so where we have to recognize, as, as they did in, in Jerusalem in those days, God rules all of us. God's, God has a plan here, and it involves the governments of men. And he is on our side, and which means that he, the way he manipulates governments is on our side. It just may not look the way we think we do, and we shouldn't give up too easily because of that. Four, we... Too quickly cower before kings and bureaucrats. I don't know about you, but I saw this during the pandemic where mm -hmm. people far too quickly backed down and said, well, they're going to shut us down. We don't want that. We might end up in prison. That would be inconvenient. <laughs> um, I was never prouder of one of our elders than when he said, well, we've been told we have to shut down. Let's wait until they do. And the rest of us kind of nodded and said, okay. <laughs> And guess what? They didn't. <laughs> they actually called our pastor and said, yep, yeah, you have to, or our pastor called them to check on it and said, yeah, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. So we can't do anything. No, but we're trying really hard to comply as best we can. No, that's good, but you have to, you can't do any of these things. Okay. I uh, understand. Good. Then we'll consider this closed. Bye. <laughs>
Our pastor did not say we are complying. He just said, he said we understand. We understand. Yeah. And I suspect the guy on the other <laughs> other side probably was not an idiot. He probably said, mm. good, you're not protesting. I can mark this case closed. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> and they never bothered us again. Um, but some people did get thrown into jail. Uh, I assume they're out now, I would hope. Mm. But again, we have to trust God. Paul and Silas ended up in jail. The apostles were arrested by the Sanhedrin more than once. Sometimes that happens, mm -hmm. and that's not something that should stop us from doing what God calls us to. Yeah, David and I were just reading Romans 13 for a different reason. Mm -hmm. But the way, we've talked about this before on the podcast, how that submit to the ruling authorities is very much given in the context of they are the avenger of blood. Yeah. They have negative sanctions to enforce. That's their job. Yeah. That doesn't mean everything they tell you to do is <laughs> godly. <laughs> no. And it doesn't mean it that doesn't. your your obedience to them is absolute as it is to God. You know, it's in this in the context of having done something that needs to be avenged, submit to the avengeness. Yeah. What's the word for that? Vengeance. <laughs> submit yeah. to the vengeance. Right. It's, but it's just very things. context specific. <laughs> yeah, and 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 the this one of the, there's a couple of things here. Just throwing these out. One, mm -hmm. we don't live in Rome. Mm -hmm. We are not ruled by an emperor. Yeah. Our founding documents say funny things like "we the people." Mm -hmm. we the supreme law of the land is the constitution. Is the constitution. <laughs> if we are appealing rightly to the constitution we the people are appealing to our founding document, that is not lawlessness. Mm -hmm. Now, there are channels we should use. There are court systems and other ways of approaching this. But we are not lawless because we appeal to our rights as Americans, mm -hmm. any more than Paul was lawless when he said, I'm a Roman. Uh-oh. Yeah, I love that. Every time he's <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to use this. <laughs> I will now this play this card. This is well within my rights. <laughs> yeah. Um, so th there's that. And then there's also sometimes, and, and this is very much, I think, what these people were facing. Where are you going, where are you going to stop backing down? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So yeah. we, we let them back us down on the wall, although technically Cyrus had said they could. It just didn't have any handy documents to prove it. Because God had told Cyrus, you're going to order the this, this city rebuilt. So he, presumably he had done what God had said. He certainly intended to. But here they stop. And when they the people come and say, where are your permits? They say, we have one. Show it to us. Um, they don't show it to them. They don't have it. It's like, you're the, you, you talk to the government. The government mm -hmm. approves it. You go talk to them about permits. It should be on file someplace. And, and they seek. And the amazing thing is that the government... Favored God's people. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that God, that sometimes the government actually is on our side. Yeah. And Sometime, it can be the right thing to make your opponent prove their position. Yes. You don't you, have to take it, take it on their terms yeah, and you, accept the burden of proof when it's not rightfully yours. You, you can stand up and say, no, sue me. <laughs> call 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 us into court. We'll meet you there, but you better have your evidence. Otherwise, you're going to be paying our court costs. Can you afford it? <laughs> um, we we have that to work with, and Christ has promised that He will use in person kings and governors to finance His kingdom. It's a, Isaiah 60 is a good place, but Revelation 21, where the kings are nursing fathers, the nations and their kings bring their treasures into the New Jerusalem. Um. In the wake of the the backlash of the pandemic, we've seen a lot of Christian people and a lot of people who at least speak well of the Christian faith suddenly pop up in all kinds of local governments as governors or, or court judges or mayors or whatever, and take a stand for righteousness. And we sometimes, go, well, where were you earlier? But I'm glad you're here now. <laughs> like, where were these people? They, they, they were kind of covered in all the smoke, but now the smoke is clearing. Wait. God has people out there who can help us. And in some cases, even very wicked people got back down because they realized, oh, 
this is not popular anymore. This could cost me, oh, I don't know my plans to become president. So <laughs> I will now distance myself from this. And the American people have a short memory. They'll probably forget. And I could be president in a couple of years. No, Gretchen so- Whitmer, we will not forget. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. We'll see how good God's people remember things. The one, one, and just in passing, this has nothing to do with this. But the American people, um, one, there, every people has its own particular spirit and character. Yes, national profiling after a sense. <laughs> the American people are not a vengeful people. Sometimes we have a short temper, and someone slaps <laughs> us, we want to slap back real fast and real hard. The <laughs> thing is, once we've knocked them down. We're the first ones to go up and say, oh, sorry, how are you doing? Can I help you up? Can I give you, can I buy you a drink? How about a cigarette? Here, let's, uh, uh, here's $20 to get you home. And uh, here's a um, stuffed animal for your little guy. We we do, we (laughs) knocked down Germany, we knocked down Japan. And who built them up? We did. We handed them our credit cards. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Um, You know, things happen and we initially, we have this intense sense of justice and things need to be righted. But it doesn't last very long, and eventually we try to go make friends with everybody and help them. Oh, they, they're they also victims, so let's help them. That's America for whatever it's worth. Israel, on the other hand, had a slightly different spirit. Their spirit was, we need to serve our God. You are in the way. We kind of cowered before you last time. We have a habit of doing that. But now God has encouraged us by his prophets, and we're not cowering anymore, and we're going to stand our ground and see what God will do. And it may mean um, the seas turn to blood and the frogs fall from the skies, or it may mean that some bureaucrat simply says, permit approved, get to work. And if we believe that God has that kind of power and that goodwill toward us and that plan for Mm -hmm. the future, Mm -hmm. it is going to shape how we respond to national and personal emergencies. When the world seems to fall apart, do we just assume, well, that's what's going to happen because that's that's what prophecy says will happen? Or do we say, God just made things tough so that we'll get tougher and deal with it? Little thing, little issue, but in the long run of the church's history and future, it's a big thing. What do we do when life is not easy, when the mission field gets hard, and when the challenges to evangelism and godly dominion seem insurmountable? Do we just throw in the towel and say, well, I guess that's what the Bible meant about last days and things? Or do we say, hmm, this looks like opportunity? Hmm. Well, that's a good place to wrap up. Do you have any recommendations? You know, you're, you know you're supposed to always start. Oh, I always forget. Um, <laughs> I would like to recommend a very easy flatbread recipe. Oh, good for it. Go for it. Yeah. Describe it. Um, it has flour and yogurt and a little bit of salt, baking soda, baking powder, and optional Mediterranean herbs. <laughs> um, I use about a cup and a half to two cups of flour. And a cup of yogurt. I do this in a KitchenAid. Definitely do not recommend doing it by hand. It's the messiest thing (laughs) in the world. Um, And it will take forever and yogurt will be everywhere. And it's not fun unless you use a stand mixer. Mm. But it's really great. You you just sort of blend it all together, put all the dry ingredients together and then add the yogurt. And then uh, roll it out on a well-floured surface once it's all all gelled and not sticking to everything in heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Um, Then you can divide it into about eight pieces and roll it out. And it's flatbread, not tortillas. So it doesn't matter (laughs) if they're round. (laughs) And then you fry them in a little bit of olive oil on your cast iron griddle. And it's, it's very tasty. Mm. Well, that inspires me to recommend a recipe of my own. I may have done this before. I, we really need to make a list, or maybe I need to make a list of things we've recommended or I've recommended. But nonetheless, it's really good. I just made it for my family not long ago, like this weekend. It's called chicken fried steak. Ooh. Now, everybody knows how to make chicken fried steak, I assume. I don't. You don't. Okay. First, you go to the store and you buy something that's probably labeled round steak or cubes, not round steak, it's labeled cube steak. And it looks like it's been kind of mashed, um, 
and it probably will say, good for chicken fried steak on it. So it's not that hard <laughs> to find. And you try to find the pieces that have the least fat and gristle running through it. Mm. Because I really don't like that in my steak. I don't mm. like to bite into a piece of steak and pull on it and half of the steak comes with it because it's ba- it's tied to one long strand <laughs> of fat or gristle or something. It's just really gross and should not be happening. So when you're ready to cook it, you get it out and you begin to, depending on what order you want to do things, you pound it nice and flat or, and you then, now that you can see what's going on, you trim off all of the fat, anything that looks gristly, anything that looks like you would not want to chew on it. <laughs> So around the edges and even down the middle, if you have nice big pieces, you may end up cutting them in half or in thirds because it doesn't matter what size you're dealing with here because some people like little pieces of steak and some people like big pieces of steak. So having done that, the rest is easy. You now um, put some flour, a goodly deal, on a plate and you take your steak that you've smushed and if you want to, you can cut it a little smaller and smaller pieces or you can just do really big pieces and you push it into the flour on both sides. So you flour your steak. Then having done that, you take about three eggs, depending on how much steak you're working with, and you crack them into a bowl and you pour in just a splash of milk or half and half or cream, it doesn't matter a whole lot. And you whip it up with a fork and you add some salt and pepper and some onion powder and some garlic powder, a little bit of paprika, whatever spices you think might be good here. And you whip it all up and then you take your floured steak and you dip it in this egg mixture. And then you take it back to the flour, which you have now replentified, so there's a lot <laughs> more flour, and you dip your floured egged steak into the next round of flour. Meanwhile, you've poured some oil into probably an iron skillet would be best, but other skillets will work because you want to get the oil really, really hot. You want it on high. And you want enough oil to more than cover, I use canola oil, you could use other kinds of oil, um, to more than cover the bottom of the skillet. You get it really, really hot. You don't want to just sit there and soak in lukewarm oil. That's no good. <laughs> so as you're, as when you you think it's ready, you put a little water in your fingers and you splash it into the oil from a distance so it doesn't splatter you. And when it hits and sizzles, you're ready. It's hot. And you take tongs. Because when you use your fingers, there's a good chance you'll burn something like yourself. And you lay it down gently so as not to splash yourself with the hot burning oil. And you let it cook really, really fast. And you do that to all of the pieces that will fit in. And after a little bit, you re-salt, re-pepper, re-garlic powder, onion powder, paprika, whatever. Um, And you continue to let it cook quickly. And this is the temptation You think it's been in there too long. I need to, you can check, you can lift it a little and see. But there's there's the point between if you turn it too soon, it's no good. If you leave it in too long, it burns. So peek a little, get a sense for it, but it's going to take longer than you think to actually thoroughly brown on one side. Once it's thoroughly brown on one side, flip it over, do the other side. And again, just a little check now and then. You don't want to burn it, but it will take a little while, even at really hot. And then you pull it out when you think it's done, and you serve it with Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> Worcestershire. Worcestershire, yeah. That's definitely in parents is good, but store brands probably will work just as well. Uh, and it is absolutely wonderful, and your children will beg you to make it over and over again. Mm-hmm. And if there should be any left over the next day, you put it on a oh, sourdough bread that you've buttered greatly, and then you butter the uh, steak. And you heat it up a little and you put it all together and you have the most wonderful steak sandwich, which mm. will not be grisly because you got rid of all the gristle up front. It's <laughs> a wonderful kind of thing that you make whenever you want all of your girls to come home on the same night because <laughs> they think they can cook everything else, but they don't know how to do this or don't think they do for some reason. They just don't <laughs> want to pay for all the steak. I don't know. So, chicken fried steak, my recommendation for tonight. <laughs> when you said, so you flour your steak. Reminded me of so the Israelites plundered the Egyptians. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to next week. Or whenever we're whenever. back. Whenever.
Yeah, whenever it happens. I look forward to it. <laughs> and we're still trying to do a recommendation episode. Yes, we are so still So we need to hear from people who are emails. listening. They need to recommend things to us. We've gotten one, mm -hmm. I think, so far. So, uh, yeah. And yeah. we did get a lovely... Oh, I should read that now. Yeah, why don't you? We got a lovely email from... From Gwen. From Gwen, our beloved Gwen. Mm-hmm. All right. I will just read this because it's right. lovely. Greetings. I was listening to the podcast First Things First. And when you got to the part about wishing God would write out his intentions for the world and us as individuals, I couldn't help thinking about what a very wise woman told me. It has stuck with me. And if I could, I would have interrupted you to say it. I really wish you had that ability. <laughs> well, I'm glad you emailed us anyway. Not trying to be a name dropper, but credit to whom credit is due. In the presence of Mrs. Rushduni one day, I said that I wish God would write across the sky, Gwen, do this. Without missing a beat, she looked me straight in the face, pointed her finger at me and said, don't you ever let anyone tell you that living by faith is easy. <laughs> As I said, I've never forgotten what she said and the intensity with which she said it. It has helped me a lot over the years. Oh, Blessings, man. Gwen. Thank you, Quinn. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Yeah. We always appreciate hearing from you. Um, if you would like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. We want your recommendations, as well as questions, comments, insults, snide comments, um, anything else you'd like to say. Uh, if you would like to uh, join the ranks of our financial supporters, you can visit our Patreon, patreon.com slash haltingtowardszion, or anchored FM. Anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. How many times have I said our website and I can still mess it up? <laughs> you can follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble. I think, I mean, those are the big ones. Uh, whatever your favorite podcast catcher is, we are there. If we're not, let us know. On that note, thank you to our producer and my lovely wedded husband, David Maxson, who keeps everything happening. Good night. We'll see you next time. <laughs>